Thank you, Jim. Good evening. It's been a pleasure to be with you here off and on this week, and I really appreciate the opportunity to share some of the things that we, some of the things that we have been doing at Emmaus and some of the things that have been on my heart as far as young people's ministry. Um, like Jim said, I just want to explain about tonight. I will just give a, a brief address, about 30 minutes, about some of the context of youth ministry in an evangelical setting in the United States, um, and also talk a little bit about how our culture, secular culture and worldviews has affected our youth and how that's affected their participation in the church and also their spiritual growth and their faith. And I would like to, what I'd like to do is break up with you and have you break up into smaller groups and just have a set of discussion questions to talk about your context in youth ministry, and then followed by a panel up here that you can ask questions from individuals who have been working in youth ministry throughout different contexts in the world and who have some experience in youth ministry um, in that right as well. Okay, so before I begin tonight, I want to ask two questions. I'm just curious. The first question is, how many of you are in a context where youth have access to Western thought through, um, through technology like social media? Can you raise your hand? That you, you work with youth in your context who have access to, to Western thought through media. Okay. Uh, second question. By a show of hands, how many of you would attribute someone personally investing in you in a discipleship relationship and caring for you, coming alongside you, how many of you would attribute that as a tremendous help to you and a significant part of your life that has gotten you into ministry today? That you've had someone come alongside you to mentor you, disciple you, okay? Well, those two questions are the questions along the lines of what kind of we're going to be looking at tonight. And so, as you can imagine, uh, youth ministry is not an exact science. It is an art, however, um, in its own right, but it's a very important subject. So as we get started tonight, um, I'm excited to share some of these thoughts with you. There's a profound reality that the gospel must be renewed for each generation, and I would suggest that it must be preached for salvation and cultivated for sanctification in the hearts and minds of individuals. While it's true that the gospel message is an inheritance to pass on to successive generations, salvation is the spirit-driven work of God in individual hearts and is not a family heirloom that can be passed on from generation to generation. But the proclamation of the gospel must be but the Spirit of God and His work must, be, must happen in, in individual hearts every generation. God's redeeming work must be proclaimed and cultivated in successive generations, regardless of cultural heritage. However, while salvation is the rebirth of individuals, our life in Christ, I believe, is taught in the Scriptures as being distinctly corporate. Now, there is... Obviously, a huge aspect of our Christian lives that's personal unto God in light of who God is and His Spirit indwelling us and showing us and manifesting itself in light of our lives individually, but God has designed us to grow corporately as we look at this wonderful truth. As a newborn can't flourish without sacrificial intentional care from adults, babes in Christ must receive intentional care from the body as a whole. And yet, while our intention is to lead individuals to Christ and raise them as members to function in a complementary and unified manner in the church, many see a different result today, especially in the United States. We have a, a significant challenge in helping successive generations maintain the church, but also flourish in the church. Many younger Christians struggle with living in a complementary, complementary unity in the context of the church, and they struggle to commit to sound doctrine and absolute truth. Our young people resist the inspired and inerrant authoritative nature of the Bible. They're tempted to regard life in Christ as individual consumers rather than sacrificial servants. And conclusions about God are based more off of personal experience and feeling than divine revelation. And over the past decades, from the 1950s post-World War II, the Western church has enjoyed a relatively successful campaign of proclaiming the gospel, uh, proclaiming the gospel, in particular, evangelicals succeeded through ministry methods such as tent meetings, door-to-door -door evangelism, good news clubs, 
revival conferences, gospel-driven summer camps, and even helpful evangelistic curriculum. However, evangelicals have faced the significant challenge of creating and maintaining a ministry of discipleship that produces spiritual maturity characterized by biblical truth in the Christian faith of successive generations. Over the past decade, the Western church has seen a mass exodus of young people leaving the church during their formative college years, never to return as adults. And prior to this, we witnessed a trend in Western evangelicalism where younger Christians wandered from their faith and the church only to satisfy the lure of the world, only to see many return after discovering life without Christ uh, to be dissatisfying and disappointing. However, right now we see a new disturbing trend of, y- of the younger generation leaving the church and simply not returning. And that's kind of the fundamental question tonight for us. This is unique in that, in a real sense, they're not leaving to chase the temptations of the world, although that's a part of it. Rather, it can be attributed to a crisis of Christian identity as they discover the significant challenge of a seemingly incompatible version of their faith, of the Christian faith in a secular world. They don't see how it's relevant. They struggle with living a life of absolute truth of the Christian faith in a secular world who no longer holds those truths or ethics of those truths. Simply put, they are leaving and disconnecting from from our church because they don't see how their Christian worldview fits into a world dominated by an antithetical one. So for tonight, it is my purpose to explore these challenges through the lens of the Western or American culture in particular. And I won't necessarily attempt to comment on the successes and challenges in reaching a younger generation through the lens of another culture. However, I do pray that all of us can explore and learn from the problems and challenges of the Western church's attempts to reach younger generations in recent decades. As we share one faith, as spoken of in Ephesians 4, and honor honor the diversity of our cultural backgrounds, let us examine the historical development of youth ministry in Western evangelicalism. Specifically, possible causes of this disconnection by taking an honest and gracious look into the challenge of absenteeism and spiritual immaturity in younger generations. May we explore the challenges of an older generation in reaching and training training them. And furthermore, lastly, I'd like to touch on... uh, and offer some practical suggestions based off of a biblical discipleship-making model in reaching and teaching younger generations and briefly examining Israel's succession mandate, Deuteronomy 4 and 6, Paul's approach to ministry training, and Jesus' model of discipleship-making. So, a younger generation has a challenge of spiritual immaturity in Western culture. There are several reasons why younger Christians seem to be spiritually immature and absent in the Western church. Let's explore a couple of those reasons. Author Thomas E. Burglar identifies these challenges as the juvenilization of American Christianity. He says, Juvenilization is the process by which the religious beliefs, practices, and developmental characteristics of adolescents become accepted as appropriate for all Christian age, for, all, for Christians of all ages. It begins with the praiseworthy goal of adapting the faith to appeal to the young, but it sometimes ends badly with both youth and adults embracing immature versions of the faith. It's worth noting that youth ministries introduced introduced necessary reform in evangelical ministry in the late 20th century through creatively developing methodology with elements of more relevant culture and social heavy peer-to-peer interaction. However, the unforeseen consequence of this approach to reaching and training younger generations ended up being the pandering of consumerism and self-centeredness and the acceptable perpetuation of adolescent immaturity living on into adulthood in American sociology and spirituality. Thomas Bergler's argument is centered on the fact that evangelical youth ministry grossly underestimated the influence that secular culture would have on presenting a clear gospel message and the ability for our youth to be a salt and light in a a secular world. In other words, they mistakenly assumed that culture was neutral and the mere implementation of secular social practices and pop culture trends would not affect the message, nor would it hurt the spiritual development of American Christian youth. The utilization of cultural trends like adolescent social rituals, music styles, fashion, 
as well as the socioeconomics of advertising, were mainly seen as mere packaging to attract large crowds in order to reach them with the gospel and teach them the spiritual disciplines of the Christian life. Cultural trends oftentimes can't be completely separated from the secular worldviews from which they're born. Simply stated, a worldview is fundamentally how an individual or society determines what truth is. This truth then forms the foundation of presuppositions for life that is determined by the individual's experiences, cultural heritage, and social rituals that the people in that society practice. While it is true that effective Christian living should maintain a very thin line between the secular and the sacred, I think we'd be wise to realize that much of the cultural packaging one uses to attract and relate to modern Christians comes from assumptions that reflect how a secular culture defines truth, which is oftentimes antithetical to our truth. It would serve us well in reaching and training successive generations to view secular culture through the context of our faith rather than view our faith through the context of our culture. Now, by the 1950s, America and the rest of the world settled into the collective relief upon the defeat of Nazism. New norms burrowed themselves into the Western psyche through the unbridled evils that World War II brought to a young generation of men. And new family roles were established with many women remaining in the workforce after the war was over. On the heels of the new norms of the 1960s and 70s, America was plunged, American society was plunged into the painful process of addressing civil rights in the midst of a growing distrust and suspicion between the government and its citizens. These were treated with intellectual, spiritual, and sexual existential exploration to make sense of life's most pressing questions of human identity and was no longer handled through a Judeo-Christian ethic. In the wake of the self-centered means of discovery, the 1980s and 90s publicly introduced a new definition of human sexuality, an unsanctified view of human life, and a non-biblical framework for marriage and family. And these things had profound impact on the youth today in American society. Things such as these built a new foundation for Western Christians to try to wrestle with within their own culture. As a result, today we see a new era of confusion about the truth in light of what is the purpose of human existence amidst a web of rightness determined by each individual to find purpose and meaning. And over the past 60 years of Western culture, new doubts in modern society have arose about who God is and what He's doing on the earth. The identity and place of the Western church is in flux with the rise of democratic liberalism and a technological boom challenging the very nature of what it means to be human. So this begs the question, how did evangelicals respond in reaching and training a younger generation in light of such complex and quick change in Western culture. Again, Thomas Bergler makes the historical argument that in trying to reach younger generations with the gospel and equip them spiritually, evangelicals adopted the following ministry methods. And I'll explain these as we go. Separation, activism, and pop cultural social trends. Like many churches today, a common youth ministry method used is separating age groups within the Christian community. And this method was started in the 1950s by many evangelical parachurch organizations that acted on the premise that churches weren't effectively reaching their youth. The thinking was that by separating youth from the rest of the body, this would allow for more effective ministry and specifically speaking into their unique social and developmental needs. And although there is great value in assessing the spiritual and social development needs of youth to more effectively minister to them, there are two two primary problems with this line of thinking. First, parachurch ministries oftentimes were under the direct influence or partnership of the local church. Secondly, under the assumption that peers who shared the same cultural social structures would be most effective in reaching each other, by adopting a model that dictated and that utilized the fact that youth would minister to youth opposed to adults ministering to youth. This, changed, this profoundly impacted and changed how we did ministry to youth. This had long-term effects still being felt and practiced in the churches to, in church today. A primary consequence was that several generations of young people were not spiritually raised to see the design and essential value of the community and function of the local church. As a result, young Christians passively avoided uh, the shepherding from church leaders, older Christians, parents, 
it also inadvertently uh, sidestepped or missed the essential training and value of the priesthood of all believers that happens in the context of the local church. This reinforced spiritual immaturity as well as alienated generations further from one another. Now with that said, I don't see the problem being separation in itself because I think there is value in, learning how, in, in um, considering how people learn and the developmental uh, needs of others and separating them for a time to help speak into their lives Christian truths and using different methodology. However, uh, the great problem came in uh, that this method of separatism produced a subsidiary of the church and became the more threatening issue. In other words, younger generations have come to believe in a Western culture that youth group or youth activities was essentially church and the corporate gathering wasn't important or primary in the development of the Christian faith. The second method Burglar identifies is activism. As, a parach- as parachurch youth ministry successfully homogenize activities to a specific social demographic, namely youth, young people, many felt the best way to make the gospel attractive and facilitate spiritual growth was to spur them on to activism or to take action with their faith. Social justice was to become the main stage to connect the gospel with the unsaved world. This activism was seemingly centralized at the expense of, at the, at the expense of sound teaching and the historical centrality of the church. America's essential and ongoing civil rights efforts, especially in the 1960s, provided an ideal environment to facilitate this. As a result, in efforts to be a light for Christ, many young Christians began to speak out concerning issues like racism, gender equality, and environmentalism. I think additionally, today's young Christians are passionate about poverty and human trafficking and capitalism. Issues such as these become the focal point in which young Christians gathered, essentially becoming the basis for their identity in in modern Christians. Emphatically, the Bible does call us Christians to be proactive in caring for the suffering and marginalized. The Bible does call us to be proactive in rejecting prejudice and bigotry and also outwardly embodying Christ-likeness. However, activism that is separated from the grounding of Christ's atoning work in love Isolated from the redemptive plan on the earth through his church can be a harmful formula producing an impure gospel and also a confused Christian identity. Unforeseen by evangelicals, many young Christians began to align themselves with secular organizations and dividing politics rather than the Christian community accompanied with a deep understanding of God's word. This led to frustration through unethical and hypocritical and ineffective efforts of the adult secular community. This eventually resulted in the apathy and indifference that would plague American youth in the 1970s and 80s and on to the 90s. As a result, this left evangelicals scrambling for another methodological fix to recapture the interest and attention of younger generations in hopes of reaching and training them for Christ and to spur them on to even more activism. Now, the third methodology that Burglar argues that evangelicals used throughout our history in modern America is a methodological fix in terms of utilizing secular culture. As churches struggle with keeping the attention of younger Christians, evangelicals began to implement tactics of secular pop culture in hopes of drawing scores of young people to preach a relevant gospel and to spur them on to be excited about doing things for Jesus, like social justice issues. And as a result, ministries began using more media, music and social activities to fill their programming and this naturally suppressed an emphasis and practice of spiritual disciplines like prayer and bible study servant leadership and ultimately a gospel-centered and driven evangelistic message for instance christianity was given a new marketing campaign i think some of you probably relate to this with t-shirts and bracelets and bumper stickers with slogans such as what would jesus do Theologically rich hymns were replaced with these catchy slogans put to the rhythm of pop culture music hits. Inductive teaching became a 15-minute scripture headline ripped from biblical context. These changes did not produce the intended result that Western evangelicals had hoped for. Instead of younger Christians receiving a spiritual shot in the arm to be openly vocal about Jesus, it produced a mentality of emotionalism and also consumerism. Young Christians grew less and less interested in studying the foundation and rationale of their faith or experiencing Jesus through piety and corporate community or even being a witness through personal sacrifice. 
Instead, they grew more and more accustomed to connecting with God through personal feelings and vied for the attention through popular, vied for attention through popular Christianese sound bites and trendy slogans. All the while allowing younger generations to be more and more separated from the greater church and to continue to perpetuate a weaker biblical foundation for who they were in Christ and why they were, why they were serving Him. As we stated earlier, culture cannot be treated as neutral. The secular worldviews of individualism crept into the Christian psyche, producing the false assumptions that church should be an emotional experience designed to meet the needs of the individual. While there is important elements of emotional connection and expression relating to God, I also think a reality of the Christian community that speaks into the needs of individuals is very much alive and important. I would agree that there is great benefit and even necessity in reimagining methodology. However, when it fundamentally changes the function of church practice that produces outcomes that are antithetical to biblical teaching, I think we need to take action. Sixty years later, we see that what was once the primary ministry methodology in the evangelical parachurch youth ministries, we now see as the mainstream methodology in most Western evangelical churches. And here lies the problem that we have today. With that said, it is it's natural to point a judgmental finger at these shortcomings. I would caution us tonight to resist the temptation of uh, sitting on our traditions, as great as they are, and expecting younger generations to simply come and show respect for the sacred preserve that we're passing on to them, although it is sacred. Instead, may we examine our, our own challenges in effectively reaching and teaching young generations. So what are our generational challenges? I've made a note throughout this week that I think I'm one of the youngest people in this conference. But that puts me in, uh, not a unique class, but that puts me in a class, I think, of, of, uh, of a peculiar situation in light of addressing these issues with my older brothers and sisters who are in this room. And this is a hard thing. It's a difficult thing. And I would, I would encourage us that we would start making it a priority or we would continue to make it a priority to listen to younger people even if they, what they say we don't agree with, even if what they say doesn't come out very articulate, even if what they say doesn't come out very appreciative. It's important that we listen to what a younger generation is saying about us and about their own people in the Christian church. As supported above, Christian sociologist David Kinnaman in his book, You Lost Me, identifies that younger Christians tend to be immature in their faith as adults and view their church experience through the lens of consumerism and entitlement. And for that, is, although that is true, for that, they, we, we get upset about that and we don't like that. However, he also suggests that Reasons many, the reasons that many young people are leaving churches and not returning is due to a disconnection in our discipleship-making efforts. And that's really what I'd like to spend the rest of our time in. What are we doing to structure discipleship for our young people? Because as all of us can attest to, that's really where the most pragmatic and fundamental and essential area of the Christian life is most influential, is discipleship. And what I mean by discipleship is knowing people, one-on-one -on -one pastoral work. That's what's going to win people over. That's what's going to help them be mature and spiritual in their lives. T statistically speaking, David Kimmon argues that the problem is not that younger Christians have been less churched. His research actually argues the contrary. The cause of this exodus could be twofold. First, young people don't feel relationally connected to older generations, according to his research. Secondly, the overwhelming majority of traditional methodology and apologetics has largely remained the same for the past 60 years. And again, I want to re-emphasize re that I don't think it's bad methodology. I think there's a rich heritage that we have. Our distinctives are very helpful, biblical, and useful for people. It's what inspired us and helped us grow, right? But oftentimes, young people... Uh, don't always connect with the way and the format that we do those distinctives. And I would propose that it has to be done through relationship 
relationship in light of considering changing our methodology. Not our doctrine. Not our absolute truth. Not dishonoring our heritage, but changing our methodology in hopes of reaching another generation who's young. And quite frankly, doesn't know any better. They didn't experience church like we have. And they don't understand it that way. This can leave them frustrated and confused with our methodology. Simply put to them, they don't feel they can address life's most pressing questions Life's most pressing questions in the church and that an older generation's brand of Christianity doesn't seem to answer the difficult questions or problems and challenges that face a complex modern world within the context of biblical Christianity. These include areas like sexuality, social justice, culture, politics, environmentalism, science, and even capitalism in our context. The point in all this is not that biblical truth is irrelevant and outdated for the modern individual, or that an older generation, <coughs> generation's methodology is not valuable or appreciated. Rather, the manner in which biblical truth has been presented and related to significant, significant areas of life is where the primary challenges lie. And I think it's vital to understand how a generation is asking questions about life through the lens of their culture, Christian and non-Christian alike. This certainly doesn't mean that we must pander to the views instilled by our secular culture. Francis Schaeffer, the great apologist of the 20th century, wrote the following in the year 1968. 1968, this is what he wrote. It was indeed unfortunate that our Christian thinkers in the time before the shift of societal moral presuppositions took place and the chasm was fixed did not teach and preach with the clear grasp of the new presuppositions that a young, that a young generation adopted. Had they done this, they would not have been taken by surprise and they, they could have helped young people to face their difficulties. The really foolish thing is that even now, years after the shift is complete, many Christians still do not know what is happening. And this is because they are still not being taught the importance of thinking in terms of presuppositions, especially concerning truth. The floodwaters of secular thought and liberal theology overwhelm the church because the leaders did not understand the importance of combating a false set of presuppositions. The use of classical apologetics before this shift took place was effective only because, this is important, only because non-Christians were functioning on the surface on the very same presuppositions. Now Francis Schaeffer's insight still applies today and is vital, I think, to reaching and teaching a younger generation. His point is that since our modern world no longer finds truth and meaning in presuppositions of Judeo-Christian ethics, which also assume a large degree of absolute and universal truth, we can no longer afford to embrace methods that assume our audience embraces the same presuppositions. It's not that we change our truth. It's not that we compromise the integrity of our truth or how it's presented in the biblical text. It's where we start. If we address non-Christians or young Christians who don't think with the Judeo-Christian ethic no longer as the base of their Christian faith, we can't address them as if they do. We have to start a couple steps back and fundamentally building up what it means of absolute truth, what it means to have a worldview and how we make decisions in life and then infuse and come in where we used to come in with the culture who thought that way. This is a very profound point and I think is helpful for us as we look at this. This is important for younger Christians in that sense culture isn't neutral as we talked about before. Western worldviews have subtly changed the very presuppositions from which Christians view their Christian beliefs. Today's young Christians are reading the same Bible, yet many do not use the presuppositions of absolute truth of a personal God, the inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture, the total depravity of man, nor the divine incarnation of the atoning work of Christ as the primary means to make sense of their Christian lives. Instead, instead, in navigating the Christian life, many use a combination of Christian truths, some of those that I've mentioned, along with the presuppositions of, of the world, like relative truth verified through experience, scripture that is subjective and can't be completely trusted, man as inherently good, and Jesus is simply an idealized man who was a perfect example more than divine incarnate in light of his penal substitutionary atonement in who Christ is as the man God. 
So as we look at these challenges, these have, fundamental, these have fundamentally changed the way they, Christians, Christian young people, ask questions, the way that they seek answers, and I also believe the way that they understand truth in general. And ultimately live in the world as far as they're living out uh, their Christian lives. The value of studying the culture of those we are reaching is that it allows us to simply understand where they're coming from and how they articulate their views and questions, recognizing their foundation for life and using it as intersections to build relationships and instill Christian truth. Invaluably, knowing this will give us the necessary framework for teaching and training a younger generation, I believe. Additionally, in struggling to understand a younger generation, Kinnaman verifies through extensive data that younger Christians have uncovered as challenges in the church that have further alienated them from the Christian community. I will summarize them just in brief and offer a, a suggestion in how we should respond. Uh, by the way, you're going to have a copy of this transcript and you can read it and then you'll have, uh, have these to look upon if you so wish. But uh, what... What challenges have young people uncovered with the church from their point of view? And again, I would suggest this is not an indictment on an older generation. We're not in the courtroom here. These are things that our young people are trying to articulate and why they're disconnected, why they struggle with their Christian faith in a modern context. So in their views, the first challenge, <coughs> David came in suggests, that the church seems to hyper-demonize the secular world by overprotecting younger Christians from secular influence to the point of isolation and an intolerance of engaging secular culture. A solution may, we might consider would be is helping them develop discernment, encouraging them to be a witness in secular culture through unsaved friendships and engage, in the engagement of social justice issues while accepting the risks of temptation and persecution that come with it. The world is riddled with risk. The world is riddled with peril. But many times I talk to a lot of Christian parents and in my own uh, experience as a parent of five, two preteens, and working with parents throughout the years of my ministry uh, opportunity to serve the Lord in youth ministry, many, uh, many parents default, Christian parents default, is to simply protect their children. And I think that's good. I think that's helpful. But at the same time, let's train them how to be discerning in reaching out to a secular world because that's the world we live in. And quite frankly, that's the Great Commission, is it not? To train our young people to engage in secular culture because that's where unsaved people are. They're not in our churches. Quite frankly, many of our young Christians don't want to be in our churches in our experience in the United States. And again, that's not a, a broad brush stroke. I don't mean at all to come off that way or indict, indicting anybody. But I think we have a great challenge, at least in Western culture, in light of reaching our young people. The next challenge that David Kinnaman uh, suggests is, uh, excuse me here, the church can be unengaging and irrelevant in real life, lacking provision for individual calling. A solution might be purposely invest in individuals and not allow programs to be the focal point. Uh, helping them discover gifting, creative talents, unique dispositions, and harness their entrepreneurial desires, unlocking how they can be used personally for God's glory and contribute to the church through secular vocation as mission, through art, through media, etc. Next challenge, the Christian faith and si that Christian faith and science are treated as incompatible oftentimes ignoring scientific contributions to everyday life that reflect God in which all humans appreciate and enjoy. And sitting here this week, I realize that many of us do enjoy technology and do enjoy how God is working through science. I think a solution is to explore the natural world with them in the context of the creative order and divine human stewardship amidst, at the same time, the complexities between spirituality or the unseen and empiricism or the seen. In areas such as creation and nature, medicine, technology, and environmentalism. The next challenge that we might <clears throat> consider in light of what we're dealing with. The morals of the Christian life are treated as legalistic rules with little chance for deeper understanding and contextualization. A solution might be is to, might be is to teach spiritual disciplines and morals of the Christian life within the context of the larger picture of the biblical account 
as well as within the realm of Christian ethics in areas such as media, dating relationships, fashion, recreation, and even materialism. Where is the gray areas our young people struggle with Christian ethics? Because we teach them absolute truth, which we should. They struggle in applying it in everyday life. The church seems to have an apprehension to reach out to the lost that can be fueled by judgmentalism and fear. A solution might be is to actively engage and reach people who are broken and marginalized and unsavory and outwardly incompatible with the Christian social structures in areas like sexuality, social justice, world religions, and politics. One thing that's refreshed me this week is to see uh, through a cross-cultural experience uh, through, through you as brothers and sisters in Christ is to see the heart that you have to reach people who are hurting, who are trapped in poverty and suffering, who are broken in light of, of, of being challenged with areas of, of oppression and injustice. In the States, we, don't, we experience it, but not to the extent to other cultures do in terms of poverty, in terms of some other social justice issues, but we are facing a, a huge epidemic in our church today, and that's the issue of sexuality. What do we do with our young people to openly talk about the, the complex problems of sexuality? I understand propriety. I understand what it means to, uh, to be careful about what we expose our young people to, but the reality is they're already exposed to it. In Western culture, they're already exposed to it. They're just hiding it. And what I fear is that we as older Christians um, we're, we're apprehensive to talk about the area of sexuality to help them make sense of how God made them because we're afraid of pushing them into pornography or immorality or pushing them into questions that they shouldn't be asking. But they are asking those questions. What do we do with the young men and women in our churches who are Christian, who have friends who are homosexuals, who are nice people, and in some right, moral people, but yet are unsaved? What do we do with our young people? And that's a challenge that we have in the States today. Because we don't want them to be corrupted. We don't want them to, 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 to be influenced by immorality. And that's true and that's good. But how do we equip people, our young people, to reach others who are in those predicaments who have different views of politics than maybe a traditional Christian uh, political scheme might have. By the way, in the States here, uh, republicanism is not Christian. It's not synonymous. They're not synonymous terms. That's the way some, uh, the secular world in Western thought thinks about Christianity, that we're all republicans. Now, I'm not arguing politics of de Democrat or Republican or whatever you might uh, embrace in any governmental aspect or political uh, uh, viewpoint. However, how do we help young people engage people who think differently from them without losing their faith? And that's a challenge. There's another challenge, and the last one that I think is the most important one, and that is uh, as David Kinnaman says in his book, again, You Lost Me, that's the name of his book, he's discovered that young people feel an insensitivity and sometimes an even hostility to questions and uncertainties that young, that, uh, that young Christians express about biblical, biblical beliefs or doctrine and practices. Do young people have the freedom to ask questions? Do, do, do the wonderful children that we baptize as children, do they have the freedom to come to us and say, you know, I'm kind of confused about this whole Jesus thing as God. Uh, I'm not sure that I believe that. And that is a major tenet that we would hold to. Yes, that is orthodox teaching. That is absolutely central and important to our Christian faith. But do we have an environment and a context to where young people can come and express doubt about their faith without being uh, ostracized or chastised or looked upon as if they have a, a, a disease or a plague that needs to be cured. Now, I, I would also argue, indeed, that we need to have solidified beliefs and convictions. That's really important. But there's an aspect of the Christian life where we're trying to make sense of the things that we say we believe, that we do believe. 
like incarnation and like the immaterial world and like uh, our, our, our heavenly place with our God in eternity. Uh, the, the, the real scary uh, aspects of hell those are, those are major doctrinal tenets for our Christian faith that we need to hold to and have conviction over, but young people have to develop that conviction. And I think sometimes, if we're not careful, um, they can feel like they can't doubt without being labeled as apostate or someone who really needs to be cured of something. Um, and that's the tricky issue. And I, and I, and I would say I don't have, have million-dollar answers to, to give you. Um, I think there's some suggestions that I would suggest in, in a minute about discipleship, but help our young people understand, but give them an opportunity to ask questions and to navigate their faith because it's not easy. Um, and all of these simply suggest that in order for a younger generation to engage their own Christian faith within their experience of the church, they must have open dialogue in the t- context of personal relationship with older Christians. And have open dialogue with, open, with older Christians about the relevance of biblical truth in the context of living in a secular world. So as we consider the lessons learned from the efforts of the Western evangelicalism and youth ministry, the challenges that modern youth face and the difficulty of leading them into maturity in, Christian, in the Christian faith, let us consider how we might approach the building of a biblical, biblically sound and culturally effective uh, discipleship model. Building spiritual maturity in younger generations. Here's some suggestions. There are several examples in which we can learn from in reaching and teaching younger generations. The following are examples of a biblical discipleship model of training patterns that are characterized by the common element of everyday interaction that is relational, that is pragmatic, and centered on biblical teaching. So I'll just come in in brief, and then we'll have some time for discussion, which I think is probably going to be most beneficial for all of us to discuss from our own context. First, the, success, the, the succession mandate of Deuteronomy 4 and 6 given to Israel is a command of remembrance and obedience concerning the sound teaching of who God is, His law, and what He has done for Israel. It was imperative that Israel pass this on to the successive generations by facil- facilitating remembrance and actively modeling themselves obedience to the younger generation. This was to be lived out in the context of the everyday, typical life experience of their youth for the purpose of building a nation to enter the land and enjoy the covenant God had made with them. Specifically, though, these things occurred in the context of their families and their tribes, also the tabernacle and feast worship observances, and also the greater community context of Israel. It was, in other words, the things that they were teaching their youth and wanted their youth to know, they were reinforced in, in various contexts. There were different connections. Not just the church, or not in this case, in this context, not just in bringing the sacrifice uh, to the feasts and to the temple entrance, or not just on the Sabbath. It was everyday context, multiple touches, multiple people collectively interacting with youth to instill this. Now, we know that that didn't go very well, but that's the format given. That's the formula given in Deuteronomy 4 and 6. Now, these were done consistently, or, or we hope they would be, in a relational community in various contexts, specifically active dialogue and inquiry. For instance, in chapter, Deuteronomy 6, chapter, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 20, when your sons ask you in time to come, etc., etc., tell them. The youth of Israel would be engaged by the older generations and were accountable active participants in their spiritual community. What we uh, struggle with in the United States is uh, many youth, in light of what I've been arguing, many youth, uh, there's not much expected of them in their Christian faith. They just kind of come, and we do everything for them. We answer all the questions for them. Sometimes we entertain them. We feed them. We do things, but we don't expect much of them. Uh, And that can be a problem as well. The second model we can look at uh, briefly in the Scripture is the Apostle Paul took an intentional interest in younger people in fulfilling the mission to the Gentiles. Specifically, he utilized Titus and Timothy. Now, if you've ever studied Titus and Timothy, just, just observation as far as uh, how Paul talked about them or spoke of them, what Paul did with them, it's quite fascinating and I think it would help us, uh, help us tonight as we think about this whole subject. Paul's approach to discipleship in order to carry out the Great Commission was highly relational. Grounded in sound doctrine, and prioritized a high degree of practical 
and intentional experiences. Just let me name a few here. Paul referred to Titus as my brother and my partner and fellow worker. He traveled to Jerusalem with Paul to observe and learn. He assisted Paul on his third missionary journey to Corinth by delivering important letters and reported back to Paul the good news there. Titus was also entrusted to collect aid for the poor of the Jerusalem church. He was tasked to organize the churches in Crete. That's a big task, right? Um, He was tasked to organize the churches in Crete with an emphasis on evangelism, correcting false teaching, and addressing immorality and appointing church leaders. He had a big job, didn't he? A young man appointed by Paul, mentored by Paul, connected with, and entrusted And I would bet that every person in this room, that one of the reasons why you're at where you're at and you are deeply ingrained in ministry around the world is because someone entrusted important jobs to you. Someone entrusted important things to you to do for the the Lord's work. And I think that's an important principle here that comes out in how Paul did it. Um, Lastly, he was commissioned and sent to, to, to be a missionary in Dalmatia. Timothy... I love, this is a long list, but I love how he refers to Timothy. Timothy was affectionately referred to as a disciple, as a helper, my fellow worker, and these are some of my favorite ones, my son, whom I love. It wasn't his biological son. My son, whom I love, that kind of relationship with a younger believer, oh, imagine the potential of that relationship. Our brother, he calls him, servant of Christ, proven, true son in the faith, my son, my dear son, and was well spoken of by the brethren. He was with Paul on his second missionary journey. While Paul was forced out of Thessalonica, Timothy stayed behind in Berea to strengthen the work. He was sent back to Thessalonica to teach and encourage the church. He he was utilized in Paul's third missionary journey and specifically sent to Corinth to evangelize and to resolve conflict, which failed, which didn't work. It worked under Titus. He was commissioned to reinforce sound teaching refute false doctrine, and train elders. Wow. Lastly, he was considered a faithful companion to Paul during his imprisonment in Rome. It's clear that Paul's attitude towards training a younger generation was characterized by a highly relational and interactive dialogue that allowed for failure, growth, and entrusted ministry tasks. They were highly involved with one another. Oftentimes, I fear that our, our model can resort to being uh, just watch me, and when it's your turn, you can do it. And there's a gap in that model because young people, they lose interest. They don't understand the, the experience and wisdom that goes along with what you're doing or what I'm doing or what an older generation is doing. Um, I think to have people alongside of us experiencing God's power, experiencing God's faithfulness that we witness, that we see, that, that I think is a model that's going to help a younger generation engage their faith, have conviction about sound doctrine, engage the practices of our church, and do these wonderful things that we've been a part of in doing. And so lastly, Jesus' approach to making disciples is my favorite And his approach was grounded in shared contextual experiences with his disciples. It was characterized by a degree of intimacy that would require commitment and intention. He was focused on the Great Commission fashioned from his person and work for the redemption of man and their future life with God. In other words, Jesus trained his disciples in the context of personal relationships and shared experiences in order to prepare them to preach repentance and redemption and train successive generations to do the same. I don't know about you, but when I read uh, John 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and I I get to uh, that wonderful uh, Lord's Prayer in light of God praying for His disciples, then He prays for future, future disciples, I just get excited of the fact to think that you and I are here tonight as part of, part of the legacy of what the disciples did in passing on the Great Commission. Wonderful work that God has done. And that we are carrying that on until Christ's return. Uh, He calls them to uh, follow him, and by removing them from the day-to-day routines, he fosters commitment and trust. 
He carefully, he's careful about teaching and modeling for them his message and purpose. He's passionate as they experience success, also failure and doubt, allowing them to learn and evaluate. They, they uh, were prepared in a manner that would allow them to be instrumental in God's ultimate plan of redemption. So, in conclusion, there are complex challenges in reaching Western evangelical youth. And I would imagine that, that some of these uh, cross-pollinate. There, we, we probably, uh, despite our cultural backgrounds and differences, there's probably intersection in light of the challenges we have with young people. And I trust that, that you found some of those tonight, some of those things that you share with us and our challenges in Western context. Uh, I think there's challenges in contextualizing biblical truth, engaging moder- modern issues, and actively reaching the next generation. But I think it can be done. I believe it can be done. It's scary. It's complex. Sometimes it's, uh, um, it's, uh, it doesn't give us notoriety. Sometimes it's not very rewarding. Sometimes it costs us sleep and resources. And sometimes it even embarrasses us. Those are complex things, but I think it can be done. And I would imagine that challenges, concerns, and solutions in teaching and training the next generation presented today are not all that unique, like I said, particularly due to the reality that technology and social media has allowed Western thought, um, many of them not good, and ideals to reach the youth, to, that reach youth of our generation. So there is going to be a microphone right here in the middle row that will be functional, and we'll be using this one for the panel. So just really briefly, um, would, would one of you uh, gentlemen like to answer the first question? The first question is, what challenges do younger generations face most often that prevent them from growing spiritually? And that's the, that's the first question. Okay, I'll answer that question. Uh, What I see uh, as a great danger today is internet uh, pornography. I think that's a great danger for our youth today. They say the average age of someone who has viewed a pornographic film on a website is 11 years old. So I think it's something that is relevant to all the cultures now that we've got internet access. And I think the danger is the sin cycle So a youth watches a pornographic film on the internet on his own. He likes it. He feels good. He goes away. He feels very guilty. He can't talk to his parents. Uh, He doesn't want to talk to his best friend because he'll be considered a pervert. He doesn't want to talk to his youth pastor. He feels really bad. So what does he do? He goes to the only place where he feels good, which is watching another movie on the internet. And so the cycle goes down. He gets more depressed. Then he goes to church. And our brethren churches have a high standard of holiness. So either it's very legalistic or we're very graceful, but he sees a level of Christianity to which he does not relate. He thinks, I'm not like that. I'm I'm so bad. I'm not going to come here anymore. So I think the great danger is that they've got such access to this on the internet that uh, it's a worry. Thank you, Colin. Um, Another question, I'll just jump to number three. How has technology influenced the spiritual growth of a younger generation, and how have you used technology to reach and train them? Would a couple of you care to comment on that question? Now, uh, we find uh, the social media, which uh, uh, can be used to reach and teach the younger generation. Uh, The younger generation, they are very much into the social media, and that can be used positively. Now, sharing the ideas, talk, uh, sharing the uh, biblical uh, lessons through the social media, and by that we can reach the younger generation. Yeah, anything you want? To... Um, I think for when we work with youth, youth people, uh, you are in the church, you have your meeting, and you have your kids like this. Most of the time, um, you are on Sunday at the church, Lord's Supper. They sit in the back, and they are in this way. Um, I think like one of the biggest problems with technology is a huge distraction for them. It's a lot of distraction, um, and you can't tell them, "Hey, don't use it," because they 
they will continue using. In our church, for example, we decide uh, we have the internet connection, but we didn't get a, a wireless a modem. We got the wire one instead of wireless, so they can get access. But instead, they can have the package for going on, on internet. So that is the downside of technology. And the good side is like we using, OK, we say, OK, if they are using so much Facebook or WhatsApp or other stuff, we are using this for Sunday school, for example. So throughout the week, we put a, post the question for Sunday, and they can have some, their own answer, but they get, they're ready, get ready for Sunday for, for our Sunday school. So it's both sides for that, and we need to deal with this. We didn't get a final answer how to, mm -hmm. but we are dealing with that. I also just wanted to add one thing that uh, we, as we are engaged with the younger generation, the first thing what we do is uh, we try to feel that we are just 21 years old. We have 82-year-old young men who are elders in our assemblies, but they continue to be spiritually youthful. That helps us to reach and teach our younger, ger younger generation well. Uh, in our assemblies, we have a perfect blend of young and old. We have youngsters who grow and become spiritually mature, and we have elders who are septuagenarians, octogenarians, but at the same time, they are spiritually youthful. So that blend, that helps us to reach them and to encourage them, teach them, and help them to grow spiritually. That's great. Great, great. Um, <clears throat> I think this question is really important in light of technology because it affects all of us and all of our young people. Is there anybody, um, any of you would like to comment on this question? How has technology affected young people in your context and how are you using it to reach them? Anybody that would like to comment on that? Do, do we have a mic still? Okay. Last year we were at the Bible school in Kamiri, we had to ask the students to unplug. It was becoming a distraction, um, and it wasn't really their spiritual growth we were, growth we were concerned with. It was physical uh, health and, and well-being. Uh, they would go to work, and it wasn't, they, don't, they didn't have internet. It was, it was low tech. They were just plugged in the whole time. Ear, earbuds, music, just the whole time. And they're out in the field working, and someone's hollering at them, saying, hey, stop, hey, come back, hey, and they, they can't hear you. So from a, from a real simple, low-tech perspective, we saw the distraction that it is. And, and we, I've been noticing that a long time. You, you fill your life up with noise, and then you can't think. You can't reason. You, you don't have time to, to process information. You, all you do is noise all the time. So, so the, the advantage of being able to unplug, uh, take a little break, remove yourself, and I think even as adults, we're, we're finding that stress adds to our life as adults. We're, we're experimenting with technology too, right? It's new to us as well. And even as mature adults, it's, it's, there's a time to pull away, to unplug, and I, I wonder if we need to teach that to our young people as a discipline. So there is a time to unplug and just, just for an hour, just for a half a day, just as an experiment, let's call it fasting, I don't know. But there is a time to pay attention to God again. And in the spiritual life, I think that that will pay us more than anything, uh, any tools that come with the technology, there, there, is, there is, needs to be weighed out and balanced. So. Um, so just for the sake of time, the, the last question that we had, and, and I'll let each of our panel uh, respond to this. Um, what have you found to be most effective in reaching and training the next generation? What have you used? What, what methodology? What have you found to be really helpful in terms of reaching next generation and training them with the gospel and helping them with their spiritual growth? So you, it doesn't matter what order you go into. Hey everyone, I'm Tony Myers. I live here in Iowa, go to a chapel about uh, two hours west of here. Um, 
With this question, uh, what have you found most effective in reaching and tra training the next generation? Um, I hope this doesn't come across as cliche, but I would say Jesus Christ and his gospel. Um, you know, I know that might sound very simplistic, but um, we, uh, we named our youth ministry, um, our high school ministry, GOSMIM, Gospel-Centered Memories Made. And we tell the kids we want Jesus Christ and his gospel to be at the center of all we say and do. And um, yes, you mentioned context a lot, Jeff. You know, the times change, things like that. But, um, you know, the gospel con transcends trends, it transcends, um, you know, I guess you'd say cultural distinctives. Um, Jesus Christ and his gospel, it's the answer for uh, pornography. It's the answer for um, a lot of things the kids struggle with. And we want them to know that we believe this. Um, we as leaders, we teach, we want these kids to know that we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We, um, we don't water down our teaching. We don't, um, we don't try to candy coat things. We keep, try to keep Jesus Christ and his gospel at the center. Um, our teaching sometimes puts, sometimes hear the analogy, put the cookies on the high shelf, meaning um, don't make it too simplified for them or too easy for them. Challenge them with hard truths. Um, who Christ is. The incarnation was mentioned. Um, God's sovereignty. Um, just the, you know, hard concepts too. Worldwide missions. And so... That's kind of what comes to mind, number five, found most important in reaching and training the next generation of youth. So. Great. Now, as far as our country is concerned, uh, we encourage to have every family, a family Bible hour, where the family sit with the children and uh, they teach them from the Bible and also uh, to share missionary stories with them. And we also uh, have a very structured Sunday school. All assemblies have very fictive Sunday school. In fact, uh, in South India, the Sunday school texts are well structured. Earlier, they were just available in the regional languages, but now they have been translated to English, and subsequently they have been translated into other regional languages. And they are very structured. By the time they complete the 10th standard in Sunday school, they get a firm footing in it. And then, of course, when the students, they complete their 10th grade, we have teens camp for them. The vacation Bible school is very strong. We encourage the parents to send them for the vacation Bible schools. Not only that, before the students, they go for professional courses after the 12th grade. We have a three weeks course uh, specially prepared for them. And they undergo those courses. And when they leave their homes and go to the campuses to pursue their professional courses, they never go away from the truth. We stick to the principles and values. We keep on changing the plans and strategies. And also we use the national holidays in our country, like the Independence Day, Republic Day, to attract the youths, uh, like arranging special programs for them, like freedom, youth freedom, that is when we... Uh, celebrate the National Independence Day. We arranged such programs. Recently we had one in the Middle East uh, for the Indian uh, brethren there that was called Login and that was specially for the youth. And all the young believers, they invited unbelievers for that meeting and many of them, they came to the faith. So such meetings are arranged. So these are the things that we do. Sunday school is very structured. Vacation Bible school is very strong in our country. I think that uh, the youth need their youth meeting. I think also they need their small groups. But growth, real growth, will come in one-to-one -one work. And I think getting back to what we heard this morning about Barnabas, he was an encourager. And if we have encouragement of the youth, then they will come, they will return, and I believe they will grow. 
I think that's really important. And something else that John mentioned this morning, I think we need to emphasize, as Don Carson, professor at uh, Trinity, once said, teenagers have a very strong sense of smell in respect of what is phony and fake and not real. If they see anything that is not real, they will reject it. And he said the worst kind of homes you can grow up in is one where there's high spiritual expectancy and low practice of the Christian life. He said if there's low spiritual expectancy, high practice, that will leave a lasting impression on the life of children and teens. I think there's a danger that many parents are going into parenting like driving a car without their hands on the steering wheel. As soon as a problem arises, they grab the steering wheel. So their child plays truant, he's not going to school, they go, oh, I've got to do something, but it's too late then. You've got to drive the car with your hands on the steering wheel and know when to take your hands off the steering wheel. I think that the, there's not enough real input from the parents, real Christian life. And I think that's a danger that's going to uh, leave a negative impression on the teens. Um, we try everything. Even we bought a PlayStation 3 for the kids. We thought at the time that that would work in order to have them in the church. Didn't work. We make great sound soccer tournament. Didn't work neither. <laughs> So we put them to work. <laughs> um, in our church, we decided to, we asked them what is meaningful for their life regarding to Christianity. And they expressed that they want to live the real Christian life. And they found that going and doing services outside the church was very meaningful. So we create different service group. They are there doing one or twice a month. They're going and serve coffee very early in the hospital for people that are waiting for the get the ticket so they can go to the doctors. Or they go and serve to the uh, orphanage mm -hmm. once every two months or to the place where you have elderly people. So that was very encouraging for us to see how they, they themselves they organize how to go there, what are they going to do, uh, what are the, the gains that they're going to share with the people. And, and also, in addition to that, we put them to the one-on-one -on -one relationship and discipleship. So we have a group of 23 people, uh, youth people, and all of them are under uh, a relationship and discipleship with the elders, with somebody else who is uh, elder or older than them or another people. Each one of them, they are being accountable. And for those who are being the mentors and that, we got together, the, the leaders, we got together every two months to check how they are doing. Very good. Well, I think, uh, think we have, we've run out of time. Um, but uh, some helpful things said by our brother, some helpful things to consider. Um, and I would encourage you, if you have questions for these individuals or questions for myself, or maybe to talk to other uh, brothers and sisters in the room, about what they're doing with youth, I think you can find out a lot of great things. So thank you uh, for giving me an opportunity tonight, and uh, Lord bless you and the rest of your time together.